for a first course in ordinary differential equations, we can do everything we need to do without reference to complex numbers. We're going to bring them up here anyway because, one, complex numbers show up everywhere as you move through higher mathematics. Two, for an ordinary differential equation, you're going to want to focus on solving quadratic equations, and there we need to know how square root of minus one relates to our ODEs. Three, we're going to have solutions that'll look like they're coming out of nowhere if we don't bring in complex numbers. So if we want to keep things coherent, complex numbers are going to be an important part of that. So let's take a look first at the best case scenario. So here, I'm going to have the differential equation, y double prime minus 4y prime plus 3y equals 0. OK, what's our usual procedure? We're going to let y be equal to e to the r x, and then I'm going to stick it into our equation, see what comes out. So what's going to happen is we're going to get an equation that's going to restrict the possibilities of our r's, and then we'll see the r's are going to cover all our bases. So take the derivative. We have e to the r x, so this is going to be a chain rule. So e to the anything, we take its derivative, just rewrite your e to the anything, and then take derivative of anything. So we put that back down, derivative of the top is r. I do that again, so it's just going to bring another r down, so I have r squared e to the rx for y double prime. Now, stick that into the equation. What comes out? We have r squared e to the rx minus 4r e to the rx plus 3 e to the rx equals 0. I factor out an e to the rx. What's left over? r squared minus 4r plus 3 equals 0. So our roots are 1 and 3, which means if I'm hunting for solutions, I want to look at e to the x and e to the 3x. Now, for those two, we'll still have solutions if I multiply by scalars and if I add them together. So the idea is going to be all solutions are going to be covered by taking linear combinations of e to the x and e to the 3x. That's the situation where things work out nicely. Let's try something a little bit different. So how about y double prime plus y equal to zero? If I go through the same procedure, what comes out will be r squared plus one times e to the rx equals zero. We throw away the e to the rx. We note we have r squared plus one equals zero. Move the one to the other side. We have r squared equal to minus one, and then we're out of luck. If I take any number, square it, I get zero or a positive number. So I'll never be able to get minus one. So first point, you're out of luck. Second point, well, we're really not out of luck because we know solutions to this differential equation are going to be the form a cosine of x plus b sine of x. OK, just to recap, simple case. If I take cosine of x, its derivative is minus sine x. Take the derivative of that derivative of the sine is cosine. So the second derivative of cosine is going to be minus cosine. Okay, put it in there, you get zero. So we do have solutions to this differential equation. So things we want to look at are going to be, okay, well, one, what will complex numbers get us? Okay, how do we get solutions where we might not have had them otherwise? And also, why do cosines and sines come out when we're starting off with things of the form e to the rx. OK, first, we've got to go through the fundamentals of complex numbers. So to start, what we do is we're going to introduce a symbol for the square root of minus 1. OK, we could call it square root of minus 1, or we can call it i. So i is much more common. So the defining property of i is going to be, if I square it, I get a minus 1. OK, if I want i to be the solution of x squared plus 1, that means i squared plus 1 equals 0. But if you put the minus 1 to the other side, that's i squared equal to minus 1. With this idea of square root of minus 1, I can now form complex numbers. So what are we going to do? We're going to take two real numbers, x and y, and we're going to form the quantity x plus yi. So we should think of i as just being a placeholder for another real number. OK, in general, You'll call a complex number by the letter z. That's typical. 
And also note, if I wanna put a picture to the complex numbers, so the real numbers got a line. Here, we need two real numbers to define a complex number, so we're gonna need a plane. The idea is gonna be, if I have x plus i, y, we're gonna send that to the point x comma y in the plane. So usually here, complex numbers referred to as the complex plane. Now, we're gonna have a lot of operations we can do with complex numbers. So let's go through these one at a time, and then we'll try to peg the geometry that goes with each operation. So first up, we got vector properties for the complex numbers. So let's talk about the addition and subtraction of two complex numbers. So what do we do? Well, if I wanna add or subtract two complex numbers, the idea is just gonna be, I take the stuff that has no eyes in it, add or subtract, take the stuff with eyes in it, add or subtract, and then recombine. So for instance, if I had three plus two i plus one minus i, I would put the three and the one together, I put the two and the minus one together, and then we just compute these separately. So I wind up getting four plus i. Now, the geometry is gonna be, we think of these as vectors. So for instance, if I take three plus two i, that gives us the point in the plane three comma two, so we'll get a point there. What I do is I take, okay, we start at the origin and I draw on the arrow that ends at three comma two. We're gonna to add to this one minus i. Okay, well one minus i corresponds to the point one comma minus one, so I'm gonna take that point, draw on the arrow from the origin, and then what I wanna do is take my first vector, and then we're just gonna go heel to toe. So the idea is we take this vector, I take this vector, and I just move this vector off the origin, put its heel up on the tip of the arrow there. So our new number is just gonna be, you go up and then down by your other one, so like this. Now if you know what'll come out, okay, the geometry is gonna make you wind up on the point four comma one, but you'll note if I just add slot wise, okay, in these coordinates here, well three plus one gives me four, two minus one gives me one. So we've got three different ways to get our answer. One is by collecting the non-i and the i stuff. The other is write your stuff as points in the plane, add slot wise, or you can draw pictures and do this heel-toe addition, which corresponds to how we add vectors. How do we do the difference? So, same idea, except for that minus sign, we're just gonna push it through our second term and then just add the vectors that result. So here, what's gonna happen? Well, I have three plus two i minus one minus i. I distribute the minus sign, so it's gonna hit both terms, so it gives me minus one plus i, and now I can just add these like we did before. So that's gonna be collect the non-i terms, that's three minus one, so we'll get a two, and then collect the i terms, gives me two plus one, which gives me a three. So we'll wind up with two plus three i. Second way, let's write things as points in the plane. So I'll have three comma two, one comma minus one. I wanna take the difference slot wise. So that'll give me three minus one gives me a two. Two minus a minus one gives me a three. And then I get my two, three again. Next, okay, a little bit different when we look at the picture with vectors. So I'm gonna draw my point over three up two. I'm gonna go over one, down one. If I put a minus sign in here, what that says is, well, what do we do here? We distributed the minus sign to each term so the idea is if I put the minus sign to each term, it's the same as flipping your vector through the origin. So our point here flips back to here. Now I wanna add this vector and this vector here. When I do that, okay, we go heel to toe. So heel, toe, heel, toe. And then that's gonna wind up on this point and that's gonna be two comma three. So again, our three different ways getting the answer all add up. Second big property, okay, again, another vector property. This is scalar multiplication. 
So all this says, and I actually used it in part one when I did the difference, if I have a real number and I multiply my complex number by that real number, it's just gonna be multiply that number on each piece. So if I take a on x plus yi, I'm gonna get ax plus ayi. All right, so on an example, we could take two times three plus two i, so the net effect is just two on the three, two on the two gives me six plus four i. What's that do in our picture? If I have over three up two, that's just gonna stretch this by a factor of two. If I multiply by a minus two, it's gonna do a stretch, and then the minus sign flips you through the origin. So multiplying by a minus one just says flip through the origin. Okay, so we'll see this here. If I multiply by minus two, minus two and the three, minus two and the two, I get minus six, minus four i, and that winds up back here. Okay, not written down, but we could also note if I multiply two, okay, on the point in the plane, three comma two, you just push that two into each term, that becomes the point six comma four, same idea. So again, you have all three different ways of thinking about it. Now, for some properties that have nothing to do with vectors, let's look at multiplication and division of complex numbers. So multiplication, what's our rule gonna be? It's gonna be, okay, think about how you multiply polynomials together, you just distribute through. It's gonna be the same thing here. The only catch is whenever I multiply an i by itself, i squared, we turn it into a minus one. So let's take a look. So I'll take, 3 plus 2i times 1 minus i. Okay, we'll do this the long way, but usually you'll just do this in your head. So I'll have 3 times this term plus 2i times this term. And now I just push the 3 through. It gives me 3 minus 3i. Push my 2i through. That gives me 2i minus 2i squared. The i squared becomes a minus 1. So that turns this into a plus 2. I have 3 plus 2 gives me 5 and then 2i and minus 3i gives me a minus i. Okay, there's definitely geometry that goes with this, but we're gonna hold for just a little bit. Before I can do division, we need the notion of complex conjugation. So, if I let z be equal to x plus yi, the complex conjugate of z, denote that by z with a bar on it, that's gonna be equal to x minus yi. So all we're doing is taking the part that has the i on it and switching the sign. Pictorially, we're taking the y, sending it to minus y, so that's just gonna be flipping in the x-axis. So if z is here, then z bar winds up down here. So it's just flip like this. Now, if we take z, multiply by z bar, Let's see what happens. I have a difference of two squares, so let me x squared minus i squared y squared. i squared is minus one, so the minus becomes a plus, so I get x squared plus y squared. So I think of z as a vector off of the origin, okay, like this, so that would be three plus two i turns into the vector with its tip at three comma two then what we're looking at here is the square of the length of that vector. So we're going to define the length of z, okay, also called modulus of z, as square root of z times z bar, or square root of x squared plus y squared. So some examples. Okay, well, we just saw if I take 3 plus 2i, okay, we take square root of the sum of the squares, so that's 3 squared plus 2 squared gives me 13, square root, modulus of this guy is square root of 13. Modulus of one plus i, okay, so there, square root of one squared plus one squared, that gives me square root of two.